So I have some kind of rules of thumb here. Now, of course, they're not going to be applicable to all instances, right? So this is just some kind of general rules to kind of guide you through how to solve problems. Okay, first, if the valence shell is already full for an, for an atom, like it's just naturally full, for example, helium, which has a two in the valence shell, and neon, which has eight in the valence shell, these atoms will be stable. They do not have to gain or lose electrons. So these um, atoms will be chemically unreactive or inert. Right? So in fact, uh, these elements, let me go back here. These elements are known as noble gases. Right? If you look at this column, see helium, neon, argon, you know, all these elements have two or eight electrons in the valence shell. So they are stable. And that's kind of why, you know, they're called noble gases because they're very inert. They don't like to react with other elements. Next scenario, if the valence shell of, uh, of an atom can hold up to eight, but only has five or six, then the atom is more likely to gain electrons, right? So think about this, which one is easier? Gain three or two electrons, three or two, or lose five or six, right? So that's a much, much bigger number, right? So it's easier for the electrons to just lose two electrons or three electrons to get to the eight. So if, uh, if it's a, a, a number closer to eight, then the atom is likely to gain electrons to get to number eight, right, in the valence shell. Examples are chlorine, fluorine. These elements are in the same column. They all have seven electrons in the valence shell. So it's easier for them to you know, gain one electron to, to satisfy the octet rule. On the other hand, if an atom has only one or two electrons in the valence shell, it will tend to donate or lose that electron. We talked about potassium earlier, right? Potassium has just one electron in the valence shell. So it's easier to just donate that electron to somebody else. Then you go down to the next shell, which now becomes the valence shell. And that shell has eight electrons already. So now you are stable. So that's kind of... Uh, the opposite of the, the, the second bullet point. Um, atoms that tend to have this feature are sodium, potassium. These elements are in the same column and they only have a one electron in the valence shell so that they tend to lose that electron. Calcium is in another column. If you look at the um, periodic table, you, you can figure out the number of electrons, do the electron configuration, and you would know that calcium has two electrons in the valence shell. So calcium just tends to lose those two electrons and then becomes a calcium ion with two positive charges. What is a chemical bond? The chemical bond is really a kind of interaction with electrons between different atoms. So atoms form chemical bonds with other atoms so they can get to eight electrons in the valence shell, which is a stable electron configuration. There are multiple ways right, to form the chemical bond. We talk about ionic bond, right? That's formed between atoms that transfer electrons between each other. And that will result in positive ions and negative ions. In the case of sodium chloride, sodium is going to donate an electron to chlorine. So sodium becomes sodium ion and chlorine becomes chloride ion. Right. Now, the chemical bond is not always formed by complete electron transfer. Sometimes the atoms share the electrons. There, They share electrons. So nobody completely takes the electrons from somebody else, right? Now they're sharing the electrons. I have a 
An example here, this is a chemical called methane, CH4. And you can see that uh, hydrogen and carbon, they are sharing electrons, right? For each hydrogen, each hydrogen atom shares the only electron it has. So you're going to have four hydrogen atoms in total, which share four electrons with carbon. And that, num that number four makes sense because carbon has four electrons in the valence shell. So in order to get to eight, it needs four more electrons. Right? So there are going to be uh, a total of four, uh, four hydrogen atoms sharing four electrons with a carbon. So for carbon, now there are eight electrons, which is perfect. It satisfies the octet rule. For hydrogen, you can see for each hydrogen now, there are two electrons, right? Which is also good because hydrogen has only one electron shell. So it can only have two in that valence shell. I just want to note something from the TIS study manual. There are some questions that require you to look up the periodic table. So like I said earlier, don't worry about memorizing anything. If you see a question like this, there will be a periodic table provided to you. So you can just click somewhere, get the periodic table out, and then use that information to answer the questions. For example, in here, it just asks you, you know, which of the neutral atoms would have 10 protons, 11 neutrons, and 10 electrons? You actually only need this information, right? Because the number of protons is the same number as atomic number. Go to the periodic table, find the 10th element, and, and that will be the correct answer. All right, now that's one type of question. The questions that I came up with are a little bit different. First question, carbon-13, nitrogen-15 have many applications in life sciences. For example, biologists have used the ratio of these isotopes to determine food chain length and trophic structures. Compared to the more common carbon-12 and nitrogen-14, carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 have a different now, even though there might be some terms you don't recognize in this question, you might not know what trophic structures are, but you can probably guess that this question is about different elements, right? And specifically, the different forms of the same element. We talk about carbon-13, we have a carbon-13 here, carbon-12. So there are both carbon but they have a different numbers here. And that number is the atomic weight. So carbon-13, carbon-13, carbon-12 are isotopes, right? Because they're both carbon, but they have different number of neutrons, which result in different atomic weight. Same thing for nitrogen-15, nitrogen-14, they are nitrogen isotopes. So the correct answer is B, number of neutrons. Uh, again, I want to mention that these isotopes have the same number of protons, same number of electrons, because the number of protons and number of electrons are the same. Also, same atomic numbers. Number two, which of the following statements correctly describes the subatomic particles? So this is related to the first and the second objectives in the study manual about the different parts of an atom. A, protons are negatively charged. You know this is not right. Protons are positively charged. Electrons are negatively charged. B, an electron has a mass of one AMU atomic mass unit, same as a proton. Now proton, a proton does have a mass of, mass of one, but electrons do not have any mass. So B is not correct. C, atoms of each particular element has a unique number of protons, but can vary in the number of neutrons. That's correct. Right? The statement is basically about isotopes. Carbon-12, carbon-13, they all have the same number of protons, which is six. 
but they do have a different number of neutrons, right? Carbon-12 has six neutrons, and carbon-13 has seven neutrons. And you can calculate the atomic mass, right? So six protons, six neutrons, six plus six, that's 12. That's where the number 12 comes from. For carbon-13, a different isotope, still six protons because there's still carbon. And number of neutrons is seven, so six plus seven is 13. So carbon-13 weighs a little bit more than carbon-12. Last statement, an atom's mass is determined by the number of protons and electrons. By this point, you should know it very well. Electrons do not count toward the atomic mass. Correct answer is C. All right, guys, we finished another lesson. We're getting close to the end. We have uh, probably a couple lessons left in the life of physical sciences and then a few lessons in the scientific reasoning. So we're almost there. Keep up the good work. I'll see you next time.